Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison of the grave. The trail started in Montana with a bum with two names rushing away from his lady love and led fast into L.A., past a southerner from Canada, a worried wool dealer and a chorus girl with a forty-five. When it finally stopped at murder in the park, the tramp was still in a hurry. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Bum's Rush. You know, there comes a time in everyone's life when a relative wants a favor. But this was a particularly nice relative. (laughs) In fact, a great old gal. She'd written my name and address in the center and her name, Jessie Gavins, Eagles Rock, Montana, in the upper left corner of the envelope. The stamps totaled away a mail special and the letter inside started off like one of those I was wrong, you've got to find him for me, you've got to types. But it didn't wind up that way. Clipped to the letter was a hundred dollar check and under that, a not too good snapshot of a bald man holding a rake who wouldn't have been helped any by better photography. Ten minutes later at exactly 8 p.m., my long-distance call was put through and the voice that belonged to Aunt Jessie was snapping at me from Eagles Rock, Montana, like the end of a whip. Certainly I wrote it. How many Jesse Gavinses do you think there are in Eagles Rock? Philip, I want you to find Jonathan Miter and see if he's all right. Yeah, you said that in your letter. Jonathan Miter is my fiancé. Aunt Jessie. Oh, I know what you're <laughs> thinking, young man, but I'm 51 and he's 55 and there's nothing wrong with the September song of the harmonies close enough. Yeah, I hope my harmony's that good when I'm 55. <laughs> Why are you worried, honey? Because he left here last week on some kind of a big deal. It's a secret. That's uh, all he'd tell me, and I haven't heard a word from him since. I see. Well, tell me, what sort of a deal would it be? I mean, what business? Uh, he's not in any business. Oh. What was his work before he retired? Uh, well, he's not exactly retired either. He's not exactly... Look, Aunt Jessie, I'm getting at this. What does he do, or what did he used to do for a living? Uh... Congratulations. Yes. (laughs) Look, you didn't happen to give that fine, honest, proud man a wad of money to finance this big deal of his, did you? Oh, no. Well, then don't, because I'll be frank. Sounds to me like a broken down con man warming up a new routine. Then I'll gladly pay to find that out, Philip. But I think you're wrong. Jonathan told me that he had to prove himself by making some money of his own before he'd marry me. (laughs) As if I didn't have enough to take care of two people already. (laughs) Okay, Jesse. It's a little off center, but I'll buy it. Uh, Huh? When you find him, don't tell him that I hired you. As I say, he's very proud, and it had hurt him. And now all I can give you to go on, aside from that snapshot I sent, is an address. 764 Hope Street in Los Angeles. 764 Hope Street. Well, how'd you get that? Uh, from checking through every single thing of his I could lay my hands on. It was on the back of an envelope. Of course, it may not mean nothing. You're so right, Jesse. Please. Jonathan was so serious and in such a hurry, and there was a funny, brave glint in his eye when he left. Do your best. A brave glint. Oh, no. Okay, Jesse, no jokes. Goodbye, darling. I felt a little sorry for my Aunt Jesse Gavins because the concept of a knight of the road rushing off on a secret quest to prove himself worthy of marriage held up like a celluloid shovel. And it got no help when I pulled to a stop in front of 764 Hope Street. It was a cramped combination warehouse and office of corrugated iron and glass brick, respectively. With a shy red and black sign reading Hirsch Woolens over a door that looked like... Well, it looked like it handled about as much business recently as a repair shop for spinning wheels. It was half open, however, so I went in just in time to catch the last round of what must have been a healthy spat going on behind a frosted glass door marked Private. Well, I'll tell you something, Mr. Eldon Hirsch. Keep your eyes more on wool and less on nylon, and you'll be better off. All right, all right. For heaven's sake, Martha, this is no time to quibble. We've got more important things to do. 
Unless, of course, you want to keep that chorus job at the plumes forever. Well? Okay. But you just watch your step. Goodbye, Eldon. Stand aside, stupid. This is a hallway, not an art gallery. Oh, there's a petty girl, if ever I've seen one. Well, what do you want? Hmm? Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Hirsch. Yes? Yeah, well, I'm Ned Johnson. I'm looking for a job. What kind? Oh, salesman. Uh, wool's my line. I see. And how long have you been waiting out here? Oh, I just stepped in. Come inside. Thanks. Sit down. Now, what is your specialty? Woolens, worsteds, or felts? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I've handled them all. I, I... We confine ourselves largely to a very high-grade merino woolen, Mr. Uh... Johnson, Ned Johnson. I've worked with merino. Well, and what about the others? Lester, perhaps? Lincoln? Oh, sure. Lester, Lincoln, uh, certainly. I, I find it all a fascinating business. So do I. A very romantic background. Yeah. By the way, what do you think of Lanatel as against Merino? Lanatel? Well, not good. Not, no, you see, I've watched the Lanatels from the range right through shearing and on up to weaving. It just doesn't compare with... Uh, uh, what's the matter? What are you really after? I slipped, huh? You fell on your face. <laughs> Lanatel is synthetic wool made from milk. Now, who are you? Okay, okay. I'm from the Sequoia Credit Association. We're investigating you. Just a periodic routine thing. It's strictly confidential. Get out, I... Get out of here and stay out if I ever catch all you. All right, take it easy. I was clumsy, that's all. Don't start a riot about Look, it. Look, you pry into my affairs again. That's quite a temper you got there. Better watch it, Hirsch. It'll get you in trouble so long. I hadn't exactly been wool gathering with Hirsch and company, but I hadn't exactly made strides on the connection between a bum in a hurry and 764 Hope Street either. However, I couldn't help wondering what Hirsch had meant when I'd overheard him speak to the girl in the office about more important things to do. So when he slammed the door on my shoulder blades, I went around to the alley for a peek in his warehouse. But I skipped that when a man stepped into view wearing the identical face I had in my pocket on a snapshot. It was Jonathan Mider. <laughs> He'd swapped the rake for a silver tip cane and patches for 14 carat class from Spatz to a Hamburg, which might well have covered a bald head. But it was the same man, no doubt about it. So I decided to play this one strictly three cushions with the reverse English. Hey! Huh? Hey, there, you! Oh, 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 were you addressing me, sir? Yeah. Don't I know you? Oh, sure I do. Points east, huh? Uh, you're mistaken, my man. I haven't been east in 30 years. Oh, come on, friend. I'd know you anyway. You're good old Jonathan Miter. Uh, sir... I am Ross J. Crowley of Canada, and I have never had the dubious pleasure of your acquaintanceship until this very moment. Ross J. Crowley of Canada, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, Mitre, if that's the way you want it. What are you doing around the wool business? Setting it up for a fleecing or just pulling it over somebody's eyes? My good man, you, you've obviously confused me with someone else. Now, pack off, like a nice fellow. I'm, I'm in a hurry. Now, wait a minute, Pop, wait a minute. Let's get this straight first. Your name's not Crowley. Why are you using it? My God, please, sir, you're trying my patience. Stand aside. Come on, let's have it. Oh, very well, if you insist. Here it is, then. Look out. Hey, hey, come back here, you old goat. Why don't you look out? Why, you awkward roughneck. Why don't you look where you're going? I was, but I, I couldn't get around all three of you. Three? What do you mean, three? You and your two big feet. If you can't keep those gunboats out of people's way by yourself, hire a pilot. Hey, you... Oh, by now, my boy's so far ahead, I couldn't catch him if he stopped for lunch. Thanks to you. Goodbye. As far as the corner, anyway, but I'd been right the first time. Jonathan Mida, alias Ross J. Crowley of Canada, was long gone, and I had no idea where. This left me with one slim, lovely lead, a lady named Marsha. If I'd eavesdropped correctly, she would shortly be making with the legs in the chorus of the Plumes Theater restaurant. It was 7.30 when I entered the platinum plated tourist trap on Hollywood Boulevard that featured small portions of bad food under glass and large helpings of good skin under lights. Cost me ten bucks and a fast ad lib backstage, but it would have been worse out front, so when the chorus high kicked its way out into the wings, I nailed Marsha as she went by. She narrowed a half a pound of mascara at me and let a footlight smile drop, which left very little else. Yeah, my name's Marsha. What do you want? Make it snappy. I gotta change. Change what? Your hairdo? Mm. This won't take a minute, baby. All I want to know is where Jonathan Mida can be found. How should I know? I never heard of him. You're stalling on your own time, baby. I got all night. Nuts to you, Jack. Blow. Come back here. This is important. Now, listen, you. I don't know anybody called Jonathan... What's his name? And put one more fingerprint on my arm and you'll get bounced out of here on your head. You know, there's just a chance you could be on the level? Yeah. Look, the guy wants about 55 and spats with a Hamburg over what is no doubt a bald dome. Carries a black cane with a silver tip and for some reason answers the name of Crowley. Crowley? Yeah, that's it. Ross J. Getting warmer, huh, kid? 
And don't bother telling me you never heard of him. So I've heard of him. So what? He's a good pal of mine. I met him a couple of nights ago. He's quite a sport. I'll bet he is. Where can I find him? What do you want him for? I want to talk to him. That's all. Where's he live? Up a tree. Like I said, Buster Blow. And like I said, baby, this is important. So important, I'll have a lopsided line in the next number if you don't talk. Because you won't be there, you'll be on your way to the pokey. Now, where does he live? I don't know. He's from Canada. You can come closer than that, sweetheart. Give. All right. He tells me he takes a walk in the park every night. He raves about the, the gladiolas. Like they grow in Coldwater Canyon Park, maybe? Maybe. Hmm. Thanks. You're a good kid. Keep your powder dry, baby. I'll see you. That park looked deserted when a half hour later I drove by it to the far end, turned down a side street and stopped. But as I started in on foot, I saw him, Spatz, Hamburg, Kane, and Alias, ambling slowly away from me along a back path. I started after him quietly, and when he got near a corner, I was close enough to hail him and then grab. But I didn't get the chance. Stand still and keep your mouth shut. I turned slowly. It was the gentleman with the big feet, and he wasn't much uglier, just a little flabbier than the automatic wrapped up in his fist. You seem to be falling over my feet every time I turn around. I noticed that. But I figured the first time was coincidence. What do you figure now? That our gay dog, Mr. Crowley, who just turned that corner there, is wagging two tails. But you hold the gavel, Chairman. And don't you forget it, either. So he gave you the name Crowley, did he? Mm Mm-hmm. Why, you think he's got another one? Stop that. We both know he's lying. What I don't know is why he took that name or why you're interested. It's a hobby. I collect old geezers with more than one name. You're going to handle hard, huh? You won't tell me? Well, I don't know your angle either. Uh, We uh, might work out a trade, huh? No. I'm not wasting any more time either. He's not going to get away from me again. And that means you'd better stay right here. Oh! He piled me up on the ground with a stomach full of pain. I saw him run down the path. When I got back to my feet, he was taking the corner. I just started after him when it came. I froze and listened. But there was nothing more to hear. I walked softly as far as the corner. He was face down, the toes of his oversized shoes digging into the grass, and the gun he hadn't time to use spilled a few inches away from his clenched, dead hand. And across the park and rushing for Coldwater Canyon Road as fast as his feet could go was a bum with two names and a Hamburg hat. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe, but first... 30 minutes packed full of talent, music, and fun. That's the Horace Height Original Youth Opportunity Show coming your way every Sunday evening on CBS. Yes, this fall, you'll hear them all on CBS. A galaxy of stars. And one of the brightest is genial Horace Height, who keeps the fun rolling with one hand and with the other pushes open the door to opportunity. Gives a talented youngster his big break toward fame and fortune in show business. Remember, Sunday night... It's Horace Height and his original Youth Opportunity Program. Listen every Sunday, starting this Sunday, over most of these same CBS stations. Tune in, tune in this fall for the shows that you love best of all. Listen carefully. Here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Bums Rush. When I took after the fleeing figure known to my Aunt Jessie as Jonathan Mitre or Ross J. Crowley, he was still barely visible ahead with arms and legs flailing the night air like so many test streamers in a wind tunnel. I didn't know any more about his double identity than I had before. But I did know that what might have started as only a confidence game of sorts had now mushroomed in a murder with the aforesaid gentleman very much involved. And a moment later when I saw him, breathless and afraid, duck into a sagging deserted wooden shack It showed a single red light and was labeled Department of Parks, Fire Equipment, Private. I figured the right time and place had come to talk it all over. When I finally carefully stepped inside and announced both myself and 38 in hand in definite stentorian tones, he agreed wholeheartedly. All right. All right. I'll come out just as you say, sir, with my hands up. (laughs) After all, I have no reason to hide. Other than murder, no. Murder? 
That noise I heard... That's what it was. Somebody was shot. No, somebody was run over by a bullet rolling downhill at a terrific rate of speed. Now, shut up and turn around, Pop. Hands still high. Oh. Time we got cautious. Oh. Are you searching for a gun on me, sir? <laughs> Young man, you must be out of your mind. First, you insist that I'm a Mr. Mr. Mitre, Mitre. Well, somebody I never heard of. And you're convinced that I'm a murderer. I don't understand you. There. No gun? Now, you satisfied? No, intrigued. Where'd you throw it? I didn't. I never had one. Anything else? Yeah, the name Crowley, Ross J. Why do you use it? Because it's mine. And that young man is a very common customer. <laughs> now, do you mind if I leave? I do. Uh, now look, old timer. Uh, I'm only going to be nice about this for a little while because, first of all, there's a fresh corpse outside, and where I stand, you could be responsible for it. First, uh, and second of all? Second of all, there's my angle, where I fit, who I work for, facts, and I don't want to reveal them unless I have to. Now, from the top... You and the dead guy, the connection, what is it? I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. You haven't, huh? Okay, Pop, we play it straight all the way. Now, listen. My name's Philip Marlowe. I'm a private detective, and I know when it's time to blow a whistle. Don't move, Marlowe, or you never will again. Oh, fine. Marsha. That's right, Marsha. And all loaded down with a nasty old 45 automatic that makes her look and feel very unladylike. Drop it, Marlowe. Come on! That's better... Now, Mr. Crowley, without waiting for Marla to apologize, go on. Go, but, but where... To the you... hotel. It's important, so hurry. Oh, yes, very well. I won't waste a second. Uh, the, the key... You uh, won't need the key. Somebody's waiting for you. Goodbye, Mr. Crowley. Uh, uh, goodbye. Uh, I, I hope I never meet you again, Mr. Maitland. Good night. <laughs> it's, it's cute, isn't it? Uh-huh, darling. The moment unimportant. Right now, you're my only concern, Marla. Oh, that's nice, Marsha. It's cozy. Just the three of us. You and that giant U.S. pistol caliber... 45. Say, baby, that's not your gun, is it? No. You feel slighted? Oh, no, no, sweet. Happy. Stay back, Marlo. Why? I'll shoot. Oh, no, you won't. You well, can't. I warn you, Marlo. No, no, no. You see, baby, you take another step, of the through. three safety devices I on mean... that army gun, that doohickey Marlo, there on I'm the side is you. one. It won't Stay work back. unless it's in the forward on, position. Oh, ah. don't be jerk. Let go of me. When school's out, I will. Now, the first question, teacher. Come on, you and Grandpa, me. alias Jonathan Mudd, also alias Ross J. Crowley, what's the game you two are playing? I don't know. Where does Hirsch fit in? Come on, it's getting late. The star pupil wants an answer. He's anxious to get to the head of the class. Talk, what is it? I don't remember, and I won't, so don't bother getting masculine or polishing apples, pupil. When I forget, I forget for a long, long time. Is that clear? Yeah, it is. And since I can't wait, since I want to go out and play, well, we'll put you right in the safe keeping. Yeah. Hey, honey, you don't, you don't mind if I go through your bag, do you? <laughs> I didn't think you would. Oh, here's a key that says in what room I'll find a team of Crowley and Mida. My, my, such a temper. After I'd picked up my 38, which the lady, who no longer sounded like one, had made me drop, and to check the hotel key that read Villa 12, Wiltshire Gardens, Beverly Hills, I ran outside and back toward my car in what I figured should be a big hurry. But when I was halfway there, I had a premonition that speed was not to be. A premonition that was a head dressed in blue, carrying a club, wearing a badge, and leaning on my right front fender. And it wasn't until I was next to him that I quit worrying about a long, involved delay. Because the officer on hand, one Kurt Lemley, was an old and I hoped still good friend. Well, hiya, Phil. I've been waiting here for you since I called in about that body up there. Some kid heard the shot. Oh. So you had once pegged this all alone and very suspicious looking car, huh? Yeah, surprised it was yours and disappointed. I'd hoped the name of the owner's tag was going to be Raleigh Newcomb. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know his name? Don't you? No. No, we were on different sides when he got shot. Oh, he's from Canada. What? Yeah, Vancouver. He had a business up there with a guy named Ross J. Crowley. Crowley? Mm hmm. Hey, Kurt, how'd you find all this out? I found a clipping in his wallet. It's got a picture on it. Oh, wait, right here. Wait a second, I'll put a light on it. Yeah, hurry up, will you? Yeah, see? See? Two guys in front of a building. That's Raleigh right. Newcomb and Ross J. Crowley officiated the Kurt. opening of the. What's the matter? Sure, it's what I figured the guy's a liar. I've already met a guy who insisted that's his name and he's ball like the Crowley in the picture. Yeah, but there's a similarity ends, even though the picture's anything but clear. What guy are you talking about, Phil? Jonathan Miter, an old geezer I was hired to find. Hmm? Bum who's pulling something fancy that incidentally ties in real tight with that murder over there. You know where he is, Phil? Sure I know. That's where I was heading when I ran into you. Oh. Ran into what, Phil? What is it? The picture. What? Kurt. Yeah? Move your thumb up a little, will you? The way you just had it. My thumb? Yeah, yeah, move it. Well, that's it, like that. Oh, brother, brother, have I got a hunch. How about what? Another murder, a neat one that's scheduled to come off any minute at the Wilshire Gardens Hotel. I'll see you later. Goodbye. At 
best, it was ten screeching stop-and-go minutes from Coldwater Canyon Park across Beverly Hills to the Wilshire Gardens Hotel on the boulevard of the same name. And all the way, I kept hoping over time that one of two things was so. Either my hunch was wrong and nobody else was going to get hurt for a while, or it was right and I was still on time. But when I was there, parked and running toward the villa number 10, which was a silent stucco square, choking to death under ivy, and showing only a single light in the living room, I was almost sure that it was going to play still another way. Me right and too late to do any good. When I tried the door and found it open, and inside saw at once the letter propped up against a lamp on an end table that I'd been afraid I'd find, there was no longer any doubt. And even as I crossed the room, I knew that I was going to read a suicide note addressed to the police, telling them that the undersigned Ross J. Crowley had taken his own life, as well as that of the partner he'd been stealing from, Raleigh Newcomb, who had currently been pursuing him. But I didn't know until I reached for the letter to make sure that I'd figured right was the last line, just before the signature. It read, also, rather than face the humility of being dragged through the courts for killing Newcomb, they have taken the life of a man who would have caught me. A private detective named Philip Marlowe. You read well, Marlowe. What? Especially when it's your own obituary. No, hey. don't move. <clears throat> well, Mr. Hirsch, huh? Or do I call you Crowley now? Doesn't matter, Marlowe. Suit yourself. What does matter is that you're not quite the boy genius you think you are. Meaning what? Meaning Marsha. You talk to her at the plumes, then she talked to me. Between the two of us, we maneuvered you around just like we wanted to. So we could include you in our plan. In other words, Marlowe, when Marsha sent Mida here from the park, we knew you'd follow. Marsha's reliable. Yeah, all year round, I'll bet. Okay, Crowley, so the one with two heads isn't Jonathan Mida, it's you. You is Eldon Hirsch here in L.A. Is Ross J. Crowley, Newcomb's partner up in Canada. A crooked partner, Crowley, who when he knew he was going to be caught, decided to kill himself, but with another guy's body. Jonathan Mida, so it wouldn't hurt. Exactly. Also, Marlowe, nobody will bother to look past what will pass as Crowley's body for the murderer of Newcomb, who I didn't expect on the scene. I think you'll admit it's all accounted for in that letter there in Crowley's, uh, my handwriting. Bravo, you've skipped nothing. Now, what about me? Yes, you. You must go before Jonathan Mida, you know. Otherwise, a coroner might find something wrong with the sequence of deaths. So it's you first, then Mida. Who no doubt is unconscious in the bedroom right now? No, Mr. Marlowe, who no huh? doubt is standing right here listening carefully. Mida, you crazy fool, stay where you are! No, no, Mr. Crowley, I won't. That way I die. This way at least I have a chance! Oh, 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 Crowley! Oh, my shoulder. Mida, Mida, you all right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Just winged. Oh, you, you got him, didn't you, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, I... Yeah. No. <laughs> no, Jonathan, you got him. That rush did it, you big... Bum, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, bum. It was two long hours of first aid for Jonathan. Arrest on the charge of murder for both Crowley and the accomplice before and after the fact, Martha. And questions and answers in triplicate for the police before... Mida and I were finally alone and back in my office waiting for a call we'd put through to, of course, Eagles Rock, Montana. But even then, the gentleman vagabond couldn't quite get over things. Then, in other words, Mr. Marlowe, uh, this Crowley who introduced himself to me as Hirsch had his fiendish plan already formulated. And on one of his trips down from Canada saw me when his train stopped at Eagles Rock. I was raking leaves around the depot. And he saw me... And he hired me on the spot because he needed someone to fit the part of his corpse. That's <laughs> it. And you'll admit you were well qualified for the job, alone in the world. Except for Jesse. Uh, which you didn't happen to mention. And the fact that you were bald. Uh, that's too true, Mr. Don't be sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Crowley or Hirsch was also bald. What? All that hair of his a wig? That's right. To pay every bit of it. And incidentally, you see, the reason I caught on to things, Johnny, a policeman found a newspaper picture of Newcomb and Crowley in Newcomb's wallet. Which told you that I couldn't be Crowley. That's right? right. It also told me more. When the policeman accidentally put his thumb over the bald part of Crowley's head, gave me a different picture. Uh -huh. Then I only paid attention to what I could see, features blurred though they were. Which you then you were Hershey's. Uh-huh. Uh, well, Miss Jessie. Yeah, Miss wait a minute, wait a minute. I know. Hello. Mr. Philip Marlowe, please. This is Marlowe speaking. 
On your call to Miss Jessie Gavins in Eagles Rock, Montana. One moment, please, sir. Here. Here, take it, Jonathan. Oh, me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, speak. All right, all right, all right. Uh, hello, Jessie. Uh, 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 Je- Jessica. Yeah, this is Johnny. <laughs> Yeah, Cuddles. Yeah, it's me, all right. I, I, I'm in Los Angeles with Mr. Marlowe. Cuddles, you don't have to shout so loud, yeah, you know. She's clean up there, the Eagle. I know, talk. but she can hear oh. you. Just talk. Uh, Jessica, Jessica, you guess what happened now. Now, I'll tell you. Yeah. A, a, a man hired me to work for him. Yeah, to pose, to pose, to impersonate a Mr. Ross J. Crowley because he said he had to be free to investigate some crooked people who would try and contact me. Yeah, <laughs> And since he offered good money, right on the spot there, Jessica, I took the job. I thought you'd be proud of me making extra money. No, wait a minute, Jessica. Mr. Marlowe, I better cut this short at night. It's long distance. It's cost money. Don't and worry I... about it, Johnny. There's no hurry. Take your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Jessica. Jessica. Now, what this man really wanted... You there, Jessica? All right. What was to use me as a corpse. Oh, that's right. A body. No, his, I feel fine. You see, he was going to put uh, his rings on me, another identification, to knock me unconscious and get me to the river. By the time I got Jonathan Mitre down to Union Station and aboard a northbound train with specific instructions to stay away from strangers and got back to my own apartment on Franklin. It was better than three o'clock in the morning. Oh, and I was tired as I emptied out my pockets and started to undress. But I forgot about that when my eye fell on the picture that Jessie Gavins had sent me in her original letter. The picture of Jonathan. Well, now Aunt Jessie was going to be happy. But I wondered for how long. Somehow the portrait of the man with a hoe with a solid look of the ages didn't fit the spare frame of Jessie's Night of the Road. A lonesome train whistle would blow in the night, and Jonathan Mido would be gone. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe star Gerald Moore and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Hans Conrad, Ann Morrison, Herb Butterfield, Wilms Herbert, and Bill Boucher. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... The lady tourist was a school teacher out after glamour, and she got it. But only after she learned that in Hollywood, the three R's could be reading, done in a dark room, writing, found in a dead man's pocket, and arithmetic that added up to murder times two. If you think you've got troubles, you should be married to Liz Cooper. She can scare up more trouble than a tropical hurricane, but it's always the kind of trouble you can laugh at because it's all part of My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball. My Favorite Husband is part of CBS's great laugh lineup for Friday nights. You won't want to miss a single minute of My Favorite Husband. And you'll want to be around, too, to hear the Goldbergs, Leave it to Joan, and Breakfast with Burroughs. They'll all be broadcast on Friday nights over most of these CBS stations starting next Friday. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.